Kalbare is often just called Hatshepsut's temple. But um, in fact, there are three temples there, which I will show you. But obviously, the main one is Hatshepsut. If you can't remember her name, the local joke is hot chicken soup. Um, but Hatshepsut. So, um, we'll look at Derobara. We'll look at who was who there. Why was it built there? Um, the relationship between that and her tomb, the uh, temple next door, her architect, what is on the various terraces, um, the um, obelisk uh, scenes, the marshes scenes, the point colonnades, and the birth colonnade. Now, the main feature of the temple of Hatshepsut is the architecture. Um, you've got these um, three terraces and the ramp. You've got the vertical lines against the great big horizontal lines of the mountain behind in Arabic, it's called Gebel. And uh, architecturally, it is very, very unique. Well, you say that, but I'm going to show you that the, the idea for it was got from somewhere else. So, who was who? Uh, right, we have Tutmosis the first. He's a pharaoh, that's why he's in red. And he married Ahmose. And she's his chief royal wife. And by her, he had Hatshepsut. He had another wife, because he's a king. And you can have secondary wives, and they're in blue. And by her, not for it, he had Tutmosis II. Um, now, uh, it was quite common in royal families for the uh, brothers and sisters to marry each other. The reason is that um, in the time of I Amen Hotep uh, III, he says, never has a, an Egyptian princess has been married to a foreigner. You know, <laughs> who the heck does these poor girls marry? can't marry Connor, so she ends up marrying her father or her brother. Uh, in this case, Hatshepsut is married to her brother, because he's not quite as royally as she is, because he's by a secondary wife, so that makes a good combination. Um, and they have a child, Neferuru, um, and Thutmose the second has uh, a secondary wife, Isis, and he has Tutmosis the third by her. Now everything in the garden was rosy. Tutmosis the first died, and Tutmosis the second came to the throne. Um, no problems there. Um, and then Tutmosis the second died. Now, initially, because Tutmosis the third was a very young child, Hatshepsut ruled as a, a region. But after a period of time, she started ruling as a royal pharaoh. Now, personally, as I discussed in the Karnak module, I think that they came to an agreement about this. He didn't want to be bothered by statecraft and administration and paperwork. Um, and she was an absolutely excellent um, admin ruler. He wanted to go off and fight and be a good general. And he was an absolutely magnificent general. So personally, I think that they um, agreed to do this. Um, and, and this isn't just my personal view. There are quite a lot of Egyptologists who have come to that conclusion. And as I discussed in the Karnak module, we do know that he wasn't as resentful of her as has always been portrayed. Now, it is possible that it was either planned or it happened, but we never actually got to hear about it, that there was a marriage between Neferuru and Thutmosis III. Um, but unfortunately, she died young, so we don't know for sure about that. Now, Hatshepsut um, was responsible for a lot of really magnificent things. Um, she did this expedition to Punt, 
Now, we're not exactly sure where Punt is, but we think it's around the area of modern-day Somalia. And she uh, went down there and uh, uh, traded with them to um, get myrrh trees and exotic goodies um, and bring them back to Egypt. She also put up this fabulous obelisk in Karnak Temple, which she's very, very proud of. Um, she did the Red Chapel um, in the sanctuary there, which is a magnificent piece of granite workmanship. Um, the temple um, is, uh, uh, this is its proper name, it's an Egyptian name. She did that. She built in the Valley of Kings. Uh, and she provided a very stable Egypt. That's her side of the story. Um, on top, most of the third side of the story, we have him as a general. He was amazing. He extended the Egyptian empire to the furthest it ever was, much further than Ramses II. Um, he went over up into Syria and Palestine, he went down to Nubia and Kush, and he went across to the Aegean. Not only that, that empire remained stable for his son, Amenhotep II, his grandson, Tutmosis IV, his great grandson, Amenhotep III, and his great great grandson, Amenhotep IV, straight aunt and aunt, is the one that lost that empire. So it wasn't just that he got it, it, it remained under Egyptian control all that period of time. At Karnak, he is responsible for the festival hall and the botanical room. And I've already talked about the botanical room and just what a, a, an amazing feat that was. And he built his tomb, KV34, which was the first decorated tomb and has some wonderful scenes. It looks like strips of papyrus painted on the walls. Um, and it's a very, very interesting tomb. It was um, built according, um, it, you know, under the secrecy method. No one seeing, no one hearing. And um, is a, a challenging place to get to. You have to climb up these steps and then you climb down these steps and um, it's you know in a niche in the in the mountainside. Um, quite quite a, a, a feat of engineering. So why was the temple built there? Um, well with um, anything uh, it's location, location, location. It is in a, a natural bay in the cliffs, which gives it a sort of picture frame for this temple. It's built with a relationship to KV20, her um, uh, royal team in the Valley of the Kings. And it is next to Monte Hotep's temple. And that was very much a um, desirable place. It had um, the beautiful Feast of the Valley come there and um, it was well-respected place of pilgrimage, that kind of thing. Um, and the architect that we believe is responsible for it is uh, Senemut and um, his relationship with um, Hatshepsut is... Um, interesting shall we say um we wish we knew more so location first now actually concentrate a little bit on this um picture because it shows Hatshepsut's temple um that's the first one but you see behind it there is another temple and that's Monchi Hotep's temple so it's actually built next to a temple. And in fact, in the middle of those two temples is a third temple, which is Tutmosis the third temple. And you can see this natural bay of the cliffs with these huge, uh, you know, uh, lines going up. And then we have the, the terraces going across. And you can see how complementary uh, the whole thing is. And just behind, 
that cliff is the Valley of the Kings. Now, I don't see if you notice if you can see right, right, right at the top of the picture, there's a little line of donkeys up there. And you can actually do a donkey ride up there and see down. And this photo was taken by some people doing a donkey ride. They gone. The, they were now on the descent, um, and it shows you. So um, I apologise for the quality of this picture, but it's the only one that I've got that shows you the temple in the foreground, and then that line, that donkey trail, and then behind that is the Valley of the Kings, and that is the location of her tomb. Now we think. Her plan was to dig her tomb, KV20, underneath so that the burial chamber would have been underneath the temple. But she hit some poor rock and it suddenly goes into a curve. So that design of going straight in and being underneath the temple was not achieved. But we do believe that that was her plan because if you follow the axis, it would have gone straight underneath the temple. Now next door is Montehotep's temple. Now if you notice this, this is, this is a square plan and it's got columns going all the way around the square. But if you were looking at it face on, you would have seen the same terracing structure that is next door. Now when she was building it, of course it wouldn't have been ruined and it would have looked from the front exactly like hers. But from the front, hers would have looked longer and bigger, um, but, but you know, replicating this idea of this terracing with the columns in front. Now right in the foreground of the picture, do you see there's another ramp? And that is the ramp that led to Tutmosis III's temple. So he built something in between the two of them, but further up the mountain. Now, who was the architect of all this? Senemut. Now, all over the temple are little drawings of Senemut. Now, people often say that they're hidden, but they're not really, because sometimes, um, although they're in a niche or whatever, the way the doors that were opened, the moment the door was open, you would have seen it. Sometimes they are behind a door, but sometimes they are visible. So um, some people have speculated that she got to find out about it and she was very cross and got rid of him. But he, he got permission to do it and he said he got permission to do it. And he puts his name all over the place. Um, so maybe their relationship was a little bit more than Queen and Architect. We don't know. And we don't know if that was a, a, an issue. We don't know if that was an issue. We have no idea. Morality of, of that time, uh, we are not clear about, you know, what they considered immoral behaviour. Um, I mean, if these poor princesses were never allowed to marry anybody but their brother or their father, um, you know, were illicit liaisons with, you know, a, a nearby courtier quite common, um, but the offspring would have been considered the offspring of the pharaoh. We just have no idea um, what they considered acceptable or not. But um, you get a feeling from his prominence that there, there was something going on here. Now, this is a plan of the temple, which I took from uh, uh, a book by Jill Camille. Um, it's generally out of print, this book. You can get hold of it sometimes in old copies, but it's one of the nicer ones of the temple. Um, and you, could, you can see the, uh, the each terrace is shown on there. So uh, you've got the north and south colonnade of the lower court and then B and C, that's the punt colonnade and the birth colonnade and then F is the top, the top terrace, the uh, opet. But you see all these little shrines going off. Now unfortunately 
there is very little access to any of these shrines, mainly because they're so, so tiny that if you started letting in the hordes that go into Hatshepsut, um, there would be a lot of damage done to them. I, I was lucky enough to go around some of these. I was taken around by the Polish mission. Um, and I can describe them to you, but I was not allowed to take photographs. Um, very often uh, excavations, they, they, hold, they want to hold the copyrights of photos so that they can make a little bit of money publishing a book. Um, but they are very, very beautifully decorated. But you'll get a chance to see that when we look at the Annulus Chapel. Now, this, this is a model in the visitor's center. So see the three ramps. See in the foreground, we have the, the ramp going up to Hatshepsut through a, a little uh, garden area and sphinxes up to the second and third terrace. Over at the back, we've got Monchu Hotep with the square um, uh, going all the round, but the, all the way around but you see from the front view it would have looked like a terrace temple and then look in the middle the big long ramp leading up to Tutmosis the third temple so not as wide as the other two but higher um, so what was he trying to say by that and it's not his only temple on the west bank but he has a few um, he's got his mortuary temple, which uh, is fairly near the Ramesseum, and he has a small temple in uh, the complex at Medinay Habu. So um, he, he was a prolific builder. Um, so one wonders what he's trying to say by, by building the, uh, his temple um, up the top there. Um, I, I don't think he's probably trying to put a point across, but um, maybe not as... as um, aggressively as it sometimes um, thought. So this is a view again from this donkey trail looking down. So you can see Hatshepsut, you can see in the middle the um, Tutmosis III temple and then you can see over on the um, right hand side the Monchu Hotep temple. Now, when Hatshepsut did her expedition to Punt, one of the things she did was bring back a lot of insect trees. And she planted them around this temple. And you see those little mounds? These are the remnants of trees that were planted here. We have also a T-shaped lake here. So, in fact, if you think about it, this is much more powerful than building a temple, making the desert bloom. I mean, they must have had people continually bringing up water on donkeys um, to keep this garden alive. Uh, what a statement. You know, when people were looking up from the, the banks of the Nile, and you can, you can see this temple from the Nile. You can see it from where I live. I can look down to it uh, on my balcony. Um, and you would have seen green. You know, in the middle of the desert. And you'll be like, wow, that hat ship thought she was a bit careful, you know, making the desert bloom. Um, the terraces have a theme. Um, there's the, uh, the terrace that talks about the obelisk that she raised at Karnak. There's a terrace that um, talks about how she controls her enemies and chaos, which is the marshes theme. There is the description of um, her expedition to Punt, and by the side of that, there's the Hathor Chapel, and there's the description of her divine birth, and beside that, the Anubis Chapel. And then on the top terrace, we have lots of descriptions of the Opex. So if you look at this um, picture again of the temple, um, I've labelled each of the terraces so that you can see um, which is which. Now, if you notice, all the tourists are going straight uphill. None of them are going round to the obelisk colonnade or the marshes colonnade. 
Now, I'm not saying they're the best colonnades, but it is so refreshing to go to a colonnade where there is nobody else. So they are well worth visiting. Um, when you're looking at the pond colonnade especially, you often have to queue to see. Um, so, you know, take your time out on the ones that you can get a bit better view of. Now, this is the obelisk um, colonnade. Trust me, I'm an Egyptologist. Um, now, I can never get this pointer to point without moving it, the slides across. But up here, there is a rectangle with lots of little rectangles. And that is the boat with the obelisks on. And um, they're shown lying side by side. It is a very, very difficult place to get a photo of um, because the, you don't get the light falling in the right way. They are talking about opening this at night. So if they do start opening it at night, it will be much easier to see it because the light will cast shadows and you'll be able to see it. So this is in the top left hand along that colonnade. Um, and if you look up there, look for the, the, the two rectangles lying side by side and then they've got little rectangles all along them. Now, this is a bit easier to see. You can see the quality of the carving here. You've got a nice picture of Hatshepsut's royal car there with beautiful raised relief um, uh, hieroglyphics. But then we have some incised hieroglyphics next to them. And they're not quite the same quality, are they? Now, remember Karna? Who likes incised relief? Yes, Ramses. Uh, so Ramses never won to miss an opportunity of taking credit where credit is not due. Um, went around slapping his name on other people's monuments, and that's what he's done here. So that's why you've got incised relief next to raised relief. Um, it's Ramesses usurping the um, monument. Now, this is, they've got the obelisks to Karnak, and um, all the men that were working on it are all having a big party and chatting and screaming and having a good time. And wow, we managed to get these obelisks all the way from Aswan to um, Karnak. Now, if you think about it, that is actually very clever. Because you look at those great big obelisks. Now, what happens if you put them on a boat? Well, exactly. It's an engineering problem, isn't it? So we think that probably what they did was that they had a dock or a quay. They had a ship in it. They, it was level with the quay. They rolled the obelisk on, but the ship was filled with sand. And as they took the sand out, the ship rose in the water and took the weight of the obelisk. Ever? No. Um, there's a lot of other engineering problems with obelisks, and um, there's been a lot of archaeology about um, you know trying to reproduce how they raise them and the stresses when they're at a certain angle. Um, we, we don't know how they overcome these, um, and it, it's still a point of contention exactly how the ancient Egyptian managed to raise an obelisk. Because if you think of the stresses when it gets to about here, um, it should snap, but it didn't. Um, so how did they do it? They're a bit clever, weren't they? Now this is the marshes side, and uh, marshes are not quite as obvious as they seem. A marsh was a scene of chaos. Now chaos um, was not what you wanted. And the pharaoh brought order to chaos. And order, one of the concepts in Egypt is mart. 
which is a goddess with a feather on her head. And she's anti-chaos, truth, rightness. It's sort of like the British, and it's not quite cricket to old man. It, it's a concept of all is right with the world. Now, if Pharaoh was a good Pharaoh, he would bring Mark to chaos. So here we have the chaos of the marshes, and there is a net on the marshes which is um, capturing all these birds and that is actually um, a religious concept of Pharaoh bringing order to the chaos of the marshes. Well having said all that highfalutin stuff, just look at the beauty of those carvings. They are absolutely gorgeous all those birds, really really lovely. And look at this, it's a heron with a fish in its mouth. And I just love this. I mean, you know, in the middle of all this detail, we have such an exquisite little carving. Um, absolutely gorgeous. Now, let's go up to the next terrace. But before we do, have a look at the Horus figures that are on either side of the ramp that are going up. Um, you notice you have a, a sort of a walkway and steps and we think that this was how the priests must have processed uh, the sacred barks up the steps to the shrines. Now this is the Punt Colonnade. Um, the depictions of the houses of Punt are shown as these uh, beehive kind of huts on stilts with little ladders going up there and then we've got this river which is alive with fish um, a really evocative little scene um, and here you can see some of these myrrh trees being dug up and put into baskets ready to be transported back to uh, the temple to be planted outside now, actually here, the, the bright white is a plaster copy, but the, the, the dullish yellow one next to it is also a plaster copy. Um, these are, the originals are in the Cairo Museum. And the bright white is the donkey that took the Queen of Punt around. And the dullish yellow one is the Queen of Punt herself. And she has these very fat legs and uh, we think she must have had elephantitis or something like that and the hieroglyphs are taking the mickey out of her and teasing and saying you know what poor donkey having to carry her along now here's the bargaining tool that the Egyptians would probably use to get their uh, goodies from Punt um, the army um, uh, a, a little bit uh, like colonial times, you know, you go there with an army and they give you all these exotic things and you give them a few beads and mirrors. Um, so this is the Egyptian soldiers coming down on this expedition and in the front there you've got the ambassador. Down below our little river with it teeming with fish but we've also got a little turtle there as well. And there he is. Now, right at the end, um, you can just see here just how fine this raised relief is. This, this is actually the, the uh, throne um, with two lions looking one today, one tomorrow, and the unification of Egypt in the middle. But what, what I put this uh, slide in is because I wanted you to see the depth of the relief and just how fine it is. Now here's the Hathor uh, chapel, which is next door, and Hathor's a, a sun goddess, um, she, she's the daughter of Ra, so she has a very sun kind of aspect to her. Um, she's sometimes shown as a female with bovine ears, or sometimes just as a female, or sometimes just as a cow. And um, uh, she's uh, very powerful. She, uh, Ra, um, uh, got angry with Mankind, this is one of their little myths, 
and he sent her to destroy mankind. So, um, not someone you want to argue with. Now, we go to the birth colonnade, and if you remember uh, the Luxor Temple module, I showed you the photo of the ancient Egyptian sex, and here is a line drawing. Now, this line drawing is taken from uh, Joyce Tysley's book on Hatshepsut. Um, I love Joyce's books. They are really excellent. And uh, I've got a huge, great book list of different books, but Joyce, she's very readable. She, I mean, obviously, she's actually, she's a professor and stuff like that. She's my tutor. Um, but her books are very, very readable. So um, I do recommend her stuff. So here's the god Armin. Uh, giving Hatshepsut's mum uh, the key of life and they're being supported on the matrimonial bed by two goddesses and this is an exact duplication of the Luxor Temple ones although this one's earlier um, and this is it I oh, know I'm sorry it's really really hard to get some of these things but if, if you concentrate really hard, you can see the two goddesses down the bottom. Trust me, I'm an Egyptologist. And this, if this isn't the angel Gabriel announcing to Mary, I don't know what is. This is the god Soth. Um, he's got his Edith's head. And he's telling the queen that she's going to, she just had sex with the god Armand. And she's going to have a little baby Pharaoh. And this is exactly like the Annunciation scene in the Bible. And you, you see a lot of other duplications like Isis and Horus that look just like, uh, you know, uh, Mary and baby Jesus. There's obviously got to be a lot of cross fertilization between these two cultures. So there she is being told that she's going to have a baby. And she, she is about to give birth. Now, if I had looked like that when I was just about to get good birth, I would have been very happy because that has a very discreet little bump. Um, a bump, yes it is, but very discreet. I mean, most ladies about to give birth have got a sizable bump. And she's being escorted by um, traditional goddesses who are going to help her in the delivery room. And there's a lot more to the scenes, but honestly, they're even worse to try and photograph. So I've just concentrated on this last one, where Thoth is announcing to Armin, you've had a baby pharaoh. And so, you know, Hatshepsut's been delivered of her mum. It's all been exactly as the god Armin wanted, and uh, Thoth is reporting back. So that's the birth colonnade. You walk down the steps, so nice shot of the birth colonnade here, I like that one, um, into the Anubis Chapel. And this is still very colourful because it's still got a lot of its roof on. Um, and uh, you can get a, a picture from here how the entire rest of the temple must have been. I mean, very garish um, to westernise. They would have, oh, wow, that's a bit over the top, and need sunglasses. But that's how they painted them. And here, do you remember our little marshes scene? Well, if you can imagine all those birds painted like this dead bird has been painted. This is an offering scene. So all the, the animals here are dead because they're going to be eaten. Um, but look at that. Look at that painting on that. And think of that marshes scene. Oh, my God, it must have looked absolutely gorgeous. Um, so do have a look at the colour. Um, in the Anubis Chapel and just try and put it over in fact everything you see in Egypt because it, it's all like that it was all originally extremely colourful now we've got the third terrace here and um, the, this uh, statues have, um, it, if you know a little bit about Egyptian sculpture they are actually very feminine one of the things is the shoulder width um, uh, that they had a canon of proportion and male shoulders should be six squares to the height of the body being 18 but these are five 
and I mean the face as well looks very feminine. She wasn't denying that she was a woman, it's just that there was no word for queen. You were king's wife. So in order to be a king, you had to be called a king and you had to have all the regalia, the false beard. Um, so in the hieroglyphs, it has uh, female endings to the words. Um, you know, the proportions are female, um, but she's shown as a king because that's the only way she could be shown to have the proper authority to rule. So that's the third terrace, and in it, it's got scenes of the OPEC festival. Now, you leave the uh, temple, you get on the little train, and you get down, and then you have to negotiate the shopping store. Um, I, most of the stuff is, is sort of cheap tat, and they do hassle you a lot. I do know some good places to shop where um, they're sourced from women's groups and um, from people in the desert and they have not got Made in China on the bottom and they are very nice. Um, you know, do be careful negotiating your way down there. Don't be forced into anything you don't want. If you do a tour with me and one of my guides you know, my guide will protect you from all this. But um, if you go down by yourself, buy a beware. Well, that's the end of the hatchet foot module. Uh, the next one is the mortuary temple of Ramses III at Medinet Habu. Um, so see you in the next module. Hope you enjoy.